Hello everyone and welcome back to LA Ram Central. This is the 42nd episode. Uh, I know I've been gone for a long time. Some of you may be thinking not long enough and others of you may be thinking about freaking time. Uh, however you want to look at it, it is good to be back and uh, I am actually currently in my living room because here in Arizona it is that hot outside. So it's one of those fireplaces that don't give off heat unless you make it. So I figured it'd be a nice little background setting. Anyway, that's me trying to be fancy. The reality is this is probably the most comfortable room to do it in, and it's also the least disruptive by the children. So um, I'm going to do the 40-second episode here. As promised, uh, I'm going to go over um, the rest of the video that we watched in the 41st episode. Sorry it's been so long, but there's more coach speak to um, give away there. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to hide it. I know I had one guy that was really upset with me saying that Les Snead was a good general manager. Um, I'm sorry, buddy, but you're alone. Uh, there isn't too many Ram fans out there that are banging the drum for Les Snead, and this interview is going to give off even more reason on why um, he's a total idiot. Um, not real thrilled with the draft. Uh, I was glad to see that a lot of the NFL people gave it a D. Um, some gave it a C minus. I think the highest grade I saw was a C plus. Uh, I think it's probably a C minus to a D, as I said before. Um, not saying that these players won't perform, but the Rams didn't address needs. So if the Rams sit there and go five and eleven, four and twelve, three and thirteen, or God forbid, one and fifteen, um, you can point the finger at this draft because the Rams had an opportunity to be better, um, and they weren't. And if they end up going ten and six, nine and seven, and making the playoffs, like. Uh, my bold prediction is going to indicate later in the month. Um, it's not because of this draft. It's because of the coaching staff. It's because of the players that were already here. It's because guys like Tyler Higby. It's because guys like Jared Goff. It's because guys like um, the you know Sullivan or um, the kid from uh, or not the kid the uh, the gentleman from Cincinnati that we picked up. It's because Robert Brooks impressed and did better than expected. It's because Tavon Austin did better than expected. It's because Ger you know Gerald Everett was able to make plays. I'm expecting one or two of those guys that we picked up to at least perform. It's also going to be because Nelson Spruce showed up, because Wade Phillips did a better job coaching defense than our previous defensive coordinator, Williams, did. It's not going to be because of this draft. And I, I don't want people with delusions of grandeur when this thing is over. Okay. Make no mistake why we made the playoffs. We will make the playoffs this year if we do in spite of Les Snead. And I know what somebody out there is going to think or a bunch of you are going to think is, well, Les Snead drafted these guys so he should get credit for it too. Yes, you're right. I concede that point. However, when we needed Les Snead to step up to the table and perform the most, he did the same thing with us that he did at the end of his career in Atlanta, which is why the Falcons got rid of him. He got hot and heavy, or as the expression goes, hot and horny, over one position and ignored everything else on the board and did not make his football team better. T Cooper Cup is not going to be able to pick up a blitzing linebacker and make the line call as a guard would do. Cooper Cup is not going to be able to protect our quarterback from getting his butt handed to him on a 3-4 blitz when they, send three of the, when they send two of the three linebackers from different angles that we didn't pick up on. That's what's going to cost us if we lose. Not lack of our guys making plays. Now, that being said, there were many times last year where we threw the football and the guy just flat out dropped it. Do I need to remind you what brainchild was behind bringing those people in? Like Kenny Britt. Like drafting Tavon Austin. Like drafting Quick. Like drafting these guys that never performed. And by the way, I do think Quick was probably our best performer last year, to be fair. Anyway, we're going to jump in with Coach Speak. We'll let the video clip play, and I'll do the same thing I did before. I'll chime in. Here you go. Les, the uh, Senior Bowl seemed to be a common thread among your draft picks. Why was that a particularly valuable evaluation tool this year? You know, it's it, w it wasn't intentional, but uh, definitely utilized. And, and anytime, we, anytime we discuss a player... Uh, in, in a draft meeting, we're going to we're going to see hey what how we rated that player at the at the Senior Bowl not only in practices but in the games. 
So I think it, it, the Senior Bowl is a great tool because what happens is you get to see in let's call it in, in Cooper Cups, you know, uh, with Cooper and Gerald Everett, they can go there at South Alabama, Eastern Washington, and go play with some of the Power Five guys, some of the best seniors in the class, and you can see them rise to the occasion or not. So it, it just happened to be a theme, but it's uh, nothing that we plan, but it is in, intentional because we do really scrutinize the Senior Bowl because it means something. And I think I mentioned it last night. Usually when you go to the Senior Bowl uh, and you play well there, you, you end up playing – well in this league and and it's interesting that's all the way to our two lane defensive lineman i can remember going to the senior bowl this year and 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 it was a it was a hectic time because i i think we you're in the we had just hired sean you're in sean's hiring new coaches i probably spent less time at the senior bowl this year than than normally so you get down there for a day obviously looking at some of the receivers and tight ends because you knew you needed to address the offense but I do remember thinking on the sideline of the scene, you know, in Mobile, who is this guy from Tulane? Because he, he seemed to be in the backfield a lot. Now, what happens is you then go back, our scouts, you know, give him what we call, hey, a thumbs up from the senior bowl. And you, you, if you have something lower on, whatever you have on him, you go back, watch him, and you realize, you know what, Tanzil's got something to him. So uh, that's kind of how the senior bowl works. It's a valuable tool. It really, really is. So right off the bat, I'm going to be overly critical. Um, did anybody else catch the fact that Les Snead needed to keep looking at his paperwork to figure out who the hell was even at the Senior Bowl? Now, that's an unfair criticism. What is a fair criticism is two things. One, Les Snead spent more time at the Senior Bowl than any other general manager in the National Football League. That was articulated by the NFL Network. That was articulated by ESPN. And that was articulated by multiple sources within the National Football League who had commented on the Senior Bowl. Why is because, as I tried explaining to this gentleman who was arguing with me a couple weeks ago, might even be a month ago now, on Les Snead being a part of the hiring process, that was because Les Snead was not a part of hiring a new head coach. Because if this guy fails, it's going to be first fire Les Snead because he didn't get the support from the general manager, then we'll look at maybe firing him. But they're not going to have these two linked together. This is going to be a Stan Kroenke hire, which he is, and he's either going to fail or succeed according to Stan Kroenke, and Les Need will be the first axe to come down um, in, the, in the firing process before they decide to fire the kid. It's just the reality. So I love how the, how the people at the, in the room didn't call him out on his lie right off the bat. That's my first criticism. My second criticism, you talk to any coach in this game, any coach in this game, the senior bowl should be utilized for three reasons. Reason number one, did you miss somebody? Did you miss somebody? Then you, you, you utilize the senior bowl. Number two, verification of what you thought. Okay? You put them against big time players all across the country and how they perform. So verification. And number three, to find out what kind of a practice ethic they have. Are they a hard worker or are they a lackluster player? Because even in that setting, you can tell who brings it to practice and who doesn't. What you don't do is exactly what Les Snead did. And guys, this is why people on the network are laughing at the Rams. This is why people all around the NFL are laughing at the Rams. Because they use this as a drafting tool. What are we doing? Now, I agree with him with the kid from Mobile, Alabama, Gerald Everett. You see what the kid can do against big-time talent. What I don't agree with is using this as a draft tool. And what he just said in that little diatribe that I let you listen to was he fully admitted, number one, that he used it solely as his number one drafting tool, okay? And number two, he used it as an excuse to try to make sure that he got involved in the hiring of Sean McVay. And as I said before, guys, go back and read the articles. There isn't an article written by a sports writer that didn't comment on the fact that Les Need was basically living at the Senior Bowl. So for him to say he wasn't there for that long of a period of time is a friggin' joke and a farce. 
He used this solely as a drafting tool. And it makes sense because he missed out on two guards that we should have drafted in rounds two and three. He missed out on a corner that we should have drafted with our second pick in round three and addressed the needs that we had. Instead, as I said before, he got hot and horny over two positions, specifically tight end and wide receiver, because he knew Joe, that Sean McVay was a wide receiver, tight ends type of person. He coached tight ends. He knew what kind of an offense he had in Washington, and he figured, ooh, I'm going to get these players to help Sean McVay. Here's the problem. You're not going to help Sean McVay when a quarterback's getting sacked on a three-step drop on the second step. Now, I understand the free agent market, and I understand being able to address the Maybe I can coach these guys up. I agree with that. And that's why I'm not leveling the hammer. In fact, as I mentioned before, and I will mention in my pre-preseason picks, my bold prediction is that the Rams will make the playoffs because I do think the coaching staff can do a better job with the offensive line, and we weren't that far away to begin with. But it speaks volumes about your general manager's laziness, inability to evaluate talent, and flat-out lack of caring about this part of the process when you use the senior bowl as your primary target. Verification. Did I miss somebody? And work ethic. You are not supposed to use it for who should we draft? How high can we draft them? Let's go back and look at the film and see if this guy's really as good as I saw in, 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 you know, through the course of senior week. No. All three are wrong. And he admitted to it on film. And like I said before, go back and read any article written by a sports writer. The Rams were well represented at the Senior Bowl. I don't know how many times I read that. And then we draft Senior Bowl guys all over the place. And maybe it'll pan out. Maybe it's a, he stumbled on a dumb strategy that actually works. But I can tell you coaches like Joe Gibbs and Joe Montana, or Joe Montana, Joe Gibbs and, and Bill Walsh never used this type of recruiting tactic okay the guys like oh god i can't even think of names off the top of my head general managers wolf for green bay comes to mind they didn't use a senior bowl this way and those guys won multiple super bowls bobby bethard didn't use the senior bowl in this way now again maybe it's new age maybe this is the way to do it time will tell i'll give them credit but i am critical because it seems to be a mistake because this is the type of thing losing teams do. It's not thinking outside the box. It's thinking quickly on your feet because you screwed up. Next clip. Both of you guys, if you'd like, to, we talked the other day about how the two of you might you know, work together in, in the room when the draft was going on. How, how did it go and is, was it as smooth as you hoped it would be? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's, and I think that, I think you're. What if he said no? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you, you're. I mean, it's like anything. You prepare the 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 main work's done in the preparation, and you got to be able to adjust in a draft because it, you know it, I was talking to our receivers coach, Coach Arbor, and for all y'all in the room, if not you, Gary, because you're probably a SC fan. Coach Arbs was a UCLA guy. But we were talking about recruiting, and, and he was going, oh, this is obviously probably a, a little bit saner process than recruiting because you're really, you know, evaluating, analyzing, figuring out whether, you know, you want to take a play or not. And I, I told Coach Yarbs, though, the only negative is, hey, you can really like someone, but there's 31 other teams picking as well. So, you know, they may pick that guy <laughs> ahead of you, uh, you know, a few spots ahead. So... That's the difference between recruiting or not. But uh, but the preparation uh, is what it does is lead to what we were talking about being smooth. And there's going to be curveballs, and you got to be able to adjust and handle it. But that's why we have, a, if you want to call it a draft board, and you, you try to use the board to do that. Yeah, that, that's the biggest thing that stood out to me is, you know, the contingency plans were in place. We had a plan going into it, and for the most part, we were able to stick to that plan. And maybe when a team made a decision that we didn't anticipate, there was decisions that we had kind of, or scenarios we had already discussed that were in place. So you weren't really caught off guard. And I think that's a credit to Les and his staff, being able to have all that in alignment. And you can kind of just trust your board, trust the preparation that, Les and his staff did and the scouts in addition to the coaches you know that was what I thought seemed like it, it made it such a nice process is that when you get around that pick 
you involve the offensive and the defensive coaches in terms of their perspective. Then we make a decision on which side of the ball we're going to address, and we move forward, and everybody feels included. And I think when that communication is clear, open, and honest, then that leads to that, uh, you know, that unified vision that we're striving to create here, and, and that's what it felt like this weekend. So do I need to mention that he said a couple of times right there, Les Need and his staff? I said this on draft day, guys. I didn't get the vibe that Sean McVay was having a decision in the process. I saw him far too often on his cell phone. I saw him far too often completely disengaged during the process of the draft. I have no doubt that they treated Sean McVay like a little boy and said, well, you're 30 years old. You don't know this process. You go ahead and sit there in the corner and let the adults handle the situation in the room. All the while, Sean McVay, who's already demonstrated how brilliant he is, said, okay, mofo, that's fine. You go ahead and play that game. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to do my best that I can to coach the talent that you have. But when this team falls on its face, and it might, it's going to be on you. Sean McVay will not get the hammer for this. If these guys don't produce, it's not going to be on Sean McVay. Now, maybe Sean McVay really wanted the kid Gerald Everett. Maybe Sean McVay did have a part in the process. I don't get the vibe, and I can tell you from coaches speak, when you say a couple of times and then go, oh yeah, and the coaches, he never said himself. He never included himself in that process. That is a way for a coach to distance himself from what he views as either a clinical mistake or a catastrophic one. He does not want to get lumped in responsible with this draft. And that proved it. So again, to my skeptics out there, to my people that think I'm overly critical of the Rams, what more proof do I need to give you? The man himself never took credit for the draft. He gave credit on the draft to the general manager and his staff. And his staff. At no point did he take responsibility for it because he knows it's not on him. Next clip. Uh, great question, and and. Uh... And you can probably strategize better earlier. So, I mean, and I'll use this year's draft as an example. Uh, hey, Gerald, uh, you know, our first pick was a favorite. Uh, Would have taken him at 37. But what you what you try to do is figure out where you got a chance to get him but not lose him and add a pick and, and – with that, with the situation, that's what you do, and you're able to, you know, you have this scenario A, and now there's some moments where when you do do it, because when you do move back and you want Gerald, as Sean will tell you, you got to go through those other picks, and you know that's, I guess that's where the adrenaline comes from, right? Okay, he didn't go off the board then, he didn't go off the board then, uh, and you, you try to figure out based on team needs, who did something in the first round, all of those things, and 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 try to predict where they're going to go. Now, once you get into the later rounds, hey, you, you might get in the fourth round and, and Josh Reynolds is there and maybe we didn't expect him to be there. Or maybe we had him rated higher enough where he could have gone earlier, but for whatever reason he was there and you didn't anticipate it. And, and that's why we made that pick this morning. He was kind of, you know, one of the better players available on our board at a position of need and became somewhat of a bonus baby, but was nice. Yeah, I think it all goes back to that preparation and when you're able to kind of just game plan and play those hypotheticals. Okay, if this happens, what would you do? And, and when you're able to kind of be thorough with that that approach and that preparation, then it, I think it can lead to being feeling very confident when those decisions have to be made based on what's played out beforehand, you feel confident in it. And that was something that even when you look at after Thursday night, here's the 32 guys that are off the board. We know that we're going to be picking in that fifth spot at 37. And, uh, you know, we sat there for about three and a half hours talking through those scenarios and just making sure that when that came up, we felt confident and, and that ended up playing out to our favor. So I like this one because it's pretty self-explanatory. They kind of get into the weeds a little bit on on what the thought process is uh, as, as guys are coming off the board and you're kind of moving along. And they kind of walk us through a little bit on the thinking and the thought process of Gerald Everett. I'm a little alarmed um, and maybe – well, I shouldn't say I'm alarmed because I'm sure there were people banging on the drum for the two guards in particular that we were talking about, uh, the Rams needing to get. But uh, obviously it was falling on deaf ears. So they were focusing on uh, tight end, which was not a position of need with um, Hemingway and, and Tyler Higby. 
Uh, it just wasn't. You could have drafted a, a middle of the road third tight end and really spent that capital on on building your O line in the future. But again, it's it's harping on pointless things. The reality is, I like this clip because it gives you a good snidbit on kind of the inside thinking um, uh, in the draft process, which is pretty cool to kind of see where our Rams were in their thinking moving along from day one into the 37th pick. And then obviously the Josh Reynolds pick, which I have no criticism on. Uh, I agree he should have been off the board a long time ago, and that was a no-duh, you better pick him. Because yes, wide receiver was a position of need going in. No one's disagreeing with that. Uh, it's just we had other positions of needs too that we didn't particularly address. So uh, I like that clip. It's pretty self-explanatory. Next clip. Well, well you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I like to say, you know, going into it, everything pre-draft is speculation. Every mock draft is as speculative as it gets, right? And usually, I like to say, after about the, let's call it after Friday night, uh, and you've gone through first, second, third round, really, really at that point, your board probably really means nothing because at the end of the day, now you have, you know, 90-plus players off the board, close to 100, and there's 150 left, and at that point, hey, doesn't really matter what you had on, where you thought they were going. Guess what? They're there. And now it's it's a matter, as Sean said, of, okay, what are your needs? Who who do we like? Where there's buy-in, and that's where today was, where you, let's be honest, you go to pick at, at let's call it 125. There's multiple players you could probably pick at 125 and be okay, but that's when you sit down and you bring in, hey, the – offensive staff the defensive staff and you come up with all right what's what's the top need okay if we don't get that player first of all it's the player there is there someone that we're just as happy with later or you know things like that and that's kind of how you work it so this part was interesting because once again my father used to say a long time ago if you give a person a long enough rope they'll hang themselves with it um, and Les Snead did that here. At 125, you bring in the coaching staff? I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. At 125, you bring in the coaching staff. No, no, you don't. No, if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers who make the playoffs every year, if you're the New England Patriots who make the Super Bowl every year, or so it seems... If you're a team that is a perennial playoff team, you bring in your coaches with the first pick in the draft. Going into the board, you have a selection of things to choose from. Again, give a man a long enough rope, and they hang themselves with it. And Les is doing a fine job of showing what kind of an idiot he is for me. So again, for my beat the drum for Les Snead guy that's out there, um, what more proof do I need to give you? Again, this draft may pan out. That doesn't mean Les needs a genius. Especially considering the Rams' bulk of their picks. Um, you know, they were such a bad football team. Just bringing in talent helps and depth. And as I said before, they're not going to make the playoffs because of Les needs draft. They're going to make the playoffs for a multitude of other reasons. But again, you heard it from the, from the man himself. You heard it from the man himself. You don't bring the coaches in until pick 125. Yeah, if you're a losing team, you do. I agree. Next clip. Les, this was your sixth draft, your first. What, how does, for you, how did this experience working with him compare to some of the others in the past? And for you, what, how would you kind of summarize going through this for the first time? Oh, the six is my favorite, <laughs> you know? Concise, clear. Yeah. And it, it's a tribute to Sean, it really is. And, and you know, it, it's six. And you, with that experience, but I can tell you the you, as I, I like to say, look, company picnics are great for – if you want to call it bonding, getting close, all of that. But to be honest with you, I really don't believe that. I think there are waste of time. <laughs> but when you get in the bunker, I'll make a note with, of that. 
when you get in the bunker with people <laughs> and you work with them, especially like we have probably over the last, you know, pretty intensely the last four weeks, uh, you know, that's that's where chemistry is built. That's where you get to know someone. That's where you, you know, you, you get to, you know, really, really bond a lot better than, you know, badminton at the company picnic. And, and you know, getting the bond with this guy to my left is – been uh you know I, it's a unique experience because he's a rare guy y'all have all been here he can come into a room and he can fire you up there's energy you want to you want to go to work you want to you want to be the best and and he's a big part of that and that's you know that's invaluable thank you les that's very nice of you say uh no i i think it's a lot of the same i think the 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 working relationship has been so seamless because we're both very passionate about football and there's been a lot of late nights where we're just sitting there watching tape, exchanging ideas, continuing to learn. You know, I'm learning a lot from him in terms of how he evaluates. We're getting on the same page with how we want to see this team and what's going to be conducive for that long-term success that we're striving to create here and, and also being mindful of the pieces that are, that are in place. And I think the biggest thing that you take away from this weekend is that there were no surprises. Everything that happened, we were able to kind of stick to the plan and trust that if it wasn't maybe priority A, there was a priority 1A in place. And it was just able to just seamlessly go right down that list. And when you're not caught off guard, everybody feels inclusive, uh, then I think that's when good things are going to happen. And, and this is why it was such a good situation and very seamless that I, I think everybody in the organization feels good about right now. And ultimately now it's about getting these guys in the building, developing them, and then helping them help us become a better football team overall. So a couple things that I want to mention here for Coach Beak. One, uh, the company line, not the company picnic, but the company line in which clearly Sean McVay is playing, he knows he's a first-year coach. He knows, I think, in the back of his head, and, and, and you could see it. You could see it in his comment and his smile when he's like, well, thank you, Les, for that. He knows full well. That if he can make less needs bundle, bungle, bungle, bumble, whatever you want to call it, screw up of a draft actually pan out, he is going to hold every card in the deck in the next draft. Meaning, play the line, pretend like you were a part of the process, bail him out with good coaching and better overall team preparation, and next year, you get the guys you want. And if you don't, you remind less of last year. So I think it goes a long way to show those the kind of cerebral thinking that Sean McVay has. And that bodes very well for a coach. You have to be five steps ahead of the next of, of, of the opponent. You have to be three plays ahead of your previous call. You have to have every expectation and scenario in your head molded. And I think what he was talking about there when he said everything went according to plan, you kind of – I think he knew no matter how much input he gave, he wasn't going to get a lot of um, – he wasn't going to get a lot of sway. Um, he might have had sway on the Gerald Everett pick. I know earlier I said he, he, he didn't. He might have in the sense of saying – if we go for a tight end, these are the players I like. And Gerald Everett very well could have been a part of that selection of tight ends. I don't think he had very much input. And that's why he could sit there and say, yeah, it went according to plan. Because that wasn't a part of the plan. And it was interesting to kind of sit back and watch this unfold and learn how this draft process works. Because next year, I won't be in this position again. I will have a draft under my belt. And I'll be able to remind Mr. Sneed... Um, on how a blind squirrel may be able to find a nut once in a while. How a broken clock may be twice, might be correct twice a day. But in all actuality, I bailed you out and now you owe me big. That's kind of what I took from that. Again, the reason I say that's coach speak is you could just tell in Les's smile at the end of his remark that he's playing along. He's playing the company line, and that pumps less up. But right now, Sean McVay? Sean McVay's playing go. 
While Les Snead, he's playing checkers. It's it's a game he's going to lose. And that's very clear. And it's funny to see somebody with experience, somebody a part of the NFL establishment, who has no clue on how somebody on the outside is playing them. And it's going to be fun to watch this relationship go 180 in a year. Next clip. Uh, what was it like to make those calls and deliver the news? Was there a, a more memorable response, or who was the, the most excited? Well, you know, I think it's it's a it's a great day for all of these guys. You know, their life's changed, and, you know, Les makes the call and, and congratulates them, and they're all excited. And, you know, Artis is trying to record some of these phone calls. He couldn't hear them quite uh, very clearly early. And, you know, Les was getting a little testy a little bit later on in the weekend. But, no, they were all great. But I, I think each of those guys, it, it is a, such a special experience. But um, I think when you look at Sam Rogers, he was especially uh, excited. You know, I think he was crying on the other end of the line. And everything that you've heard about him in terms of the passion that he, that he plays with, what he's meant to that university at Virginia Tech, um, I think it was especially exciting for him. But all of these eight guys, they had a great uh, sound in their voice and looking forward to seeing these guys in person. I owe artists a public apology. <laughs> but it's... We're in day three. It was it was round six or seven. There you go. Hey, in all fairness to Les, he did apologize right after. He said, I'm sorry, man. I'm taking it out on you. <laughs> so uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is what were you taking out on that guy? Um, the fact that the draft wasn't going as well as you thought it was. But what I like about this clip more than anything um, is the – camaraderie that you see uh two things you definitely see a a camaraderie within the organization there is a um there is a sense of unity that wasn't there under jeff fisher and uh i know les felt like he was under the gun quite a bit um and rightfully so but that shows you the type of character of sean McVay in the sense that He's playing the team game to benefit the football team and less appreciates it. And that is going to create, I think, a trust and a relationship that we are going to need between head coach and GM in the future, which is why I said that relationship will probably take a 180 turn next year. And Sean will get a lot more say because he's going to be like, look, man, I, I played the game. Now let me do my thing. Um, cause a coach can't cook the dinner without the groceries as Bill Parcells once said. Um, the other thing that I really like about this clip is the fact that the guys coming in are excited to be Rams. Uh, you didn't hear, and, and I guess they're not going to say it, but everything that I've read, these guys are ecstatic that this is the organization they're going to, despite being picked later. You know, you hear guys that go, oh, I'm just excited to play football. These guys are excited to be Rams. They're excited to be in L.A. So those are all positives. I like that. Let's go ahead and go to the next clip. You know, I think when you look at Sam, he did a lot of nice things over the course of his career for Virginia Tech. Really versatile player. Uh, he will play fullback for us, uh, so he and Zach Lasky will get a chance to compete. And uh, I think both those guys were productive players in, in college that had good rushing stats. You know, Zach being more of that fullback uh, at Georgia Tech and, and kind of that wishbone offense where he got a bunch of carries. But I thought you saw Sam do a nice job contributing the run and the pass game. I think he's a guy that when you get him out in space, he can fit people up and press them on angles. And those are kind of the, some of the little nuances that we'll look for from that fullback spot. And I think some of the teams, you know, you might not use it as often, but if you have a guy that you feel like can can fulfill that role, you can do some different things that, that might regulate a defense based on who you're going against. And we're hopeful that those two guys will be able to do that for us when we're in our 21 pa packages and 22 personnel and different things that would require you using a fullback. I love this one because it's it, it's diving a little bit into the head of Sean McVay. Um, we're all excited about Sam's draft pick, the fullback from Virginia Tech, the, the, the kid they got in the sixth round, I think it was. Um, I, I'm ecstatic with it because I do think it's going to allow the Rams to do more eye formation stuff. But that's coaches speak, ladies and gentlemen, for we're going to utilize the fullback in both the run and the passing game. 
He's going to try to make him like the next Tom Rathman. Um, and I'm okay with that. Tom Rathman was a great pass catching fullback who could run block. Um, and when you gave him the ball, you could rely on him to get kind of some rock steady yardage for you. Old time Ram fans. Um, think John Capaletti, uh, that type of back who can play tailback if need be, but will probably play in the role of fullback most of his career. So, um, I like that, uh, analysis on Sam, uh, go ahead and play the next clip. I think he had a lot of different plays like that. You know, I, I think as a ball carrier and as, as a pass catcher when he's slipping down the seam, but he does a lot of nice things, and, and I think he's done that throughout the course of his career, so that's why you're excited to add Sam to the mix. Why do you remember the wheel route? Well, first off, he got way the hell downfield. Second, <laughs> he threw Eli Apple. Here's what's great. So Going it's, a couple it's, years it, back. We're, we're three days in. I've already, you know, lost my temper and, you know, <laughs> not having to apologize to art, I mean, artists, but we go to review, you know, uh, let's call it a few picks. I mean, a few spots before we're going to pick Sam Rogers, we're going to go, Sean and I are going to go review Sam because we did fullbacks, you know, you know, let's call it a week or so back. And when you get to doing fullbacks after so many meetings, they're not the most exciting players. Right. So, but it's awesome. We needed energy and, Sean reviewing Sam Rogers and seeing some of the wheel route stuff. I mean, he had. I mean, Sean is jacked about the he had a, watching he had a Sam Rogers. Pass too on a like, this play. is awesome. Did you see that one when he when he threw the touchdown pass? Oh yeah, I think he did Sean put a play on in. Sam Rogers, huh? Yeah. I think I think Sean stood up, did some type of fist movement, and, and put a designed a play for the playbook right then. Probably shouldn't tell the other thirty one teams what's coming, but oh, that's it's, a, it's coming, Indy Week One. <laughs> So for those of you out there like me that are big Sam Roger fans, uh, get excited because when the head coach is excited about a guy, he's going to really have to screw the pooch in practice and through the process of preseason and through camp to not be the starter. Um, Sam's the guy, and they're already putting plays in the playbook for him, whether they're wheel routes or dives or whatever the case may be, that's only going to improve this offense that much more. Um, if you're like me and you love Sam Rogers, this clip speaks volumes. Y you don't need to know more about how pumped up. Obviously, Sam Rogers as well was a Sean McVay pick, which I'm glad he was involved in the process in round six and seven. But man, if Sean can hit round six and seven, and it's funny too, because that's the pick most of you guys were excited about on the draft review. Oh, Sam Rogers. I love that pick with Sam Rogers. Well, we just got word that was McVay's pick. Get excited. Get excited. Because not only is that his guy that he's excited about, but that's his pick. I got to love it. So look out, Indy. It's going to be fun. Great question. I like to say in the sixth and seventh round, I just need a sponsor, right? Because they're in the sixth and seventh round for a reason. Uh, so, uh, don't want to hear the negatives, want to hear the positives. But I think that's where going back to the bunker preparation leads to and and where the work is done and, and the coaches have done a nice job along with the scouts. And, yes, we all can have fun doing the first, second, you know, you know, even third rounds. But it's when it's when the fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh. And, and at that point, it, whether it's each position coach, coordinator, uh, Coach Fossil, he's done work on them, and you're able to basically sit and talk. Hey, how does this player fit? How does he help us? Does he have a chance of making the team? What's his role? And I think that's how you, you go through that. Because at the end of the day, it, it, hey, the National Football League's a bell curve, and and the great players, the first and second rounders, and it can be – it can be later picks that end up being at that very, very, you know, thin area of the curve. But we all like to say, you know what, championships are won in that in that fat area. And there's a lot of players that come from the, the mid rounds to late that fill up rosters and when you're playing games and you're in a playoff run and one of those guys in that thin area of the curve actually has to sit out because of an injury, there can be this 
other guy come in and heck he could be from West Alabama college free agent interception goal line Super Bowl win in Malcolm Butler so you never know and it's and I think that comes into preparation and, and it's really sitting with working with Sean and his staff and seeing what's a fit what our roster looks like how we're going to use players and that's the that's the that's probably the fun part of this so I'm going to end on a positive note um this to me shows that Les Need at least understands how to build a team. Maybe with Sean McVay's help, he can actually learn how to properly draft a team, but he at least understands how to build a team. I have no doubt in my mind that Cooper Cup is going to be a good football player. You're not going to convince me until I see him perform in preseason. And in the regular season, that he is going to be anything more than a filler player. I know there's a lot of people out there that are loving Cooper Cup. Oh, this guy's going to be fantastic. He is what five foot nine. The days of having Smurfs rule the turf on a football field, they ended in the '90s, guys. They did. Um, and you can give me Wes Welker all you want, and you can give me. Um, Edelman, all you want, but look at the rest of the New England Patriot wide receivers. You need to have, when Edelman was the guy in New England, they weren't, he wasn't nearly as productive. Edelman needs Gronkowski. Cooper Cup is going to be a nice piece, and I'm not going to say that he's anything terrible, and I'm not going to say he's anything spectacular until I see him play on the field. Nelson Spruce, I took the same approach with. And you saw what that kid can do on the field. And everybody, myself included, were ecstatic with Nelson's performance. And then unfortunately the injury. Now he's going to have to prove it again in the preseason. What I am excited about is a guy like Cooper Cup, potentially, a guy like Nelson Spruce, potentially, are guys that can come in in the event that there's an injury because unfortunately they're going to be stupid and Tavon Austin's going to start. Farrell Cooper, Robert Brooks are good football players. But you surround them with a wide receiving core of four. So think about it. You've got Robert Brooks. You've got Tavon Austin. That'll probably be our one and two. Then Cooper Cup in the slot. Nelson Spruce is your four. Farrell Cooper is your punt returner, kick returner, and number five receiver. And Reynolds, where does he fit in? That's going to be our, 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 our six wide receivers. Now, whether they line up that way, I have no idea. Maybe Reynolds ends up replacing Tavon Austin, and Austin goes in the slot, and Cooper Cup's a fourth guy. Or maybe it's going to be Cooper Cup and Reynolds, and who knows how it's going to unfold. But it is nice to know that the one thing I'm pulling from this draft is, at the very least, we built depth this year, and next year we get those winning pieces. Um, but we got some nice pieces. We just didn't address the needs that we needed to address. And it's good to know that Les Need, as much as I insulted him through the course of this last two episodes, that he at least understands what it's going to take to build a team. So I'm excited about that. Now that's going to wrap up the 42nd episode. Episode 43... Um, for those of you that like my enthusiasm, my rants, my frustrations, you're not going to want to miss episode 43, which will also be filmed this week and will also be posted this week. Um, at least that's the plan. Um, I'm extremely excited to do the next one. I wasn't as excited to do this one, probably why it took me so long. But now that I'm doing them, I'm extremely excited excited to do the next one. Um, episode 43 will not be as long as episode 42 was to come out. Because um, to be honest with you, um, I'm about to go off. I'm about to go full-on Italian, just ballistic on the National Football League. You're not going to want to miss it. And it's all in defense of our quarterback, Jared Goff. <laughs>